Thank you for coming to Aradis Gija Museum. Today we're very honored to have a very special guest. This will be his second uh, talk at the Aradis Gija Museum, Dr. Sebo Aslanian, uh, who's now the head of the Armenian chair at UCLA. Today's event is our last event for our season and will take off for three months and then we'll resume again in September and then October again. Um, I would like to also remind you that there is a conference in July by ARPA Institute. There are flyers outside. Dr. Panosian is here. If anyone has any questions and would like to support the program, uh, he's available and they need all your support so they can make this event successful. It's going to be sometime in July. I don't remember the date, I'm sorry, but the flyers are out there. Um, now I would like to invite, today's event is collaborated with National Association for Armenian Studies and um, we've always been working with NASA organizations. Today we have four of the co-chairs of Southern California who are present. And also I want to mention that we have Dr. Huri Berberian here, Dr. Sebo's wife, who is now the head of the chair of the Irvine Institute uh, University. So Dr. Best of uh, success in your new venture. I know it's not going to be easy, it's challenging, but you're up for it, Dr. Berberian. So I'd like to invite now uh, Rupen Berberian, the co-chair of NASA, to present our speaker for the day. Rupen. Good afternoon, I'd also like to welcome you today. This is the 14th event that we've had so far in 2017, thanks to uh, Maggie's uh, uh, monumental work that she does. So we really uh, appreciate her collaboration uh, with, uh, with NASA. Um, uh, she did mention the ARPA Institute uh, an uh, anniversary celebration. So they're celebrating the 25th anniversary of ARPA, and it's on July 15, 2017 and it's a full day conference and a banquet and there are tickets available from Hago um, if you want them and the topic of the conference is uh, Armenians and Armenia in the 21st century a strategy for long-term development and it has a pretty good uh, list of excellent speakers uh, that are coming from Armenia and elsewhere and Europe uh, so check out that, uh, that event. Today we have a topic um, uh, from Nakhichevan to the Netherlands, Thomas Vartabet of Anand and Armenians uh, printing in Amsterdam, 1677 to 1708. Uh, it's by Sebu Aslanian, who is the grandson of Armenian immigrants from Sepastia and Aradgir. His family first moved to Alexandria, Egypt, and then to Ethiopia in 1917. He was actually born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. His maternal grandfather, George de Gerayan co-founded the first privately owned printing press in Ethiopia in 1929. His father was also a printer, so therefore it's no surprise that his academic interest in printers uh, is fairly strong. Also, uh, similar to the mobility of the new Julfa merchants, uh, he's also been fairly mobile. Uh, because of the Ethiopian revolution, his family immigrated to New York and then they went to uh, Sarja United Arab Emirates, where Dr. Aslanian attended middle school. Then he moved to Canada and finally to the United States. In 2007, he received his PhD with distinction in Armenian Studies and Middle Eastern History from Columbia University. His PhD dissertation was chosen as the best in the humanities at Columbia University. He also received the distinguished dissertation award from the Society of Armenian Studies. While at uh, Columbia, he received the Zohra Liebman Fellowship, and uh, you may be curious, uh, this was funded by Krikor Zohra's daughter. Uh, he also received the Columbia University Dissertation Travel Fellowship to his favorite uh, spots, Venice and Vienna, and then he got the Columbia University Dean's uh, Summer Research Grant actually before that, and also to go to Venice and Vienna, and he also received the Tavitian uh, Fellowship. In the 1990s, he received his Master in Historical Studies and Political Science from the New School for Social Research in New York. He started off his education with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1989 from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, 
And uh, some of the other graduates of uh, McGill include uh, Justin Trudeau, who's the current Prime Minister, William Shatner of uh, Star Trek fame, Burt Bacharach, uh, the musician, and Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the National Security Advisor of the Carter Administration, and unfortunately, he died last week. Also, as you probably guessed by now, I'm also a McGill graduate, so I spent a little bit more time on McGill. Uh, Dr. Cebu Eslingen is um, Associate Professor and he's the holder of the Richard Hovhannessian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, uh, established by the Armenian Educational Foundation. Prior to that, he was an assistant professor at California State University, Long Beach, and uh, he was a Mellon Foundation po uh, postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University and uh, a Ma Manukian postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan and a visiting assistant professor at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. Dr. Islanian has uh, organized three major conferences. The first one was in 2012 with the title uh, Port Cities and Printers, Five Centuries of Global Armenian Print. The next one um, in 2015, Genocide and Global History, a conference on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. And uh, a few weeks later, on April 26, he had uh, a conference in Istanbul that was originally supposed to be held at Bilgi University, but uh, they canceled the conference at the last minute. And uh, fortunately, he was able to change the venue to the Bosporus University, the old Roberts College in Istanbul, and the conference was held. We're hoping that he, his next conference uh, will materialize this year uh, because it's the 300th anniversary of the 1717 establishment of the Michitaris congregation at St. Lazaro. So we're hoping that happens later on this year. Uh, some of the other awards he's received are the uh, Penn Literary Award for the Most Outstanding First Book of the Year from the University of California Press, the Hushang Pusharati Iranian Studies Book Award from the Middle Eastern uh, Studies Association, and his book was selected by the Committee of the California World History Library as the first book to appear in the prestigious new series, Authors Imprint, which celebrates and recognizes accomplished works by first-time authors. His first book, uh, published before he got his PhD in 2004 uh, from Venice, was Dispersion History and the Polycentric Nation, the Role of Simeon Yerevansi in the 18th Century Armenian National Revival. And the award-winning book that we talked about was From the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, The Global Trade Networks of Armenian Merchants from New Julfa. And this was in 2011 by the University of California Press. Some of the books he has in process uh, include Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Domain, 1500 to 1800, and A Voyage of the Santa Catarina, a global micro history of the early modern Indian Ocean. Uh, Dr. Cebu Aslanian has articles appearing in Anal Histoire Science Social, American Historical Review, Book History, Diaspora, a Journal of Transnational Studies, Etudes Arméniennes Contemporaines, uh, Handis Amsoria, a Journal of World History, Journal of the Society for Armenian Studies and the Journal of the Study of, of the Social and Economic History of the Orient. Uh, he's somewhat of a romantic. In, in 1816, Lord Byron visited San Lazaro in Venice, and he followed in his footsteps. And we'll end on a personal note. He's married to Huri Berberian, as, as it was mentioned, who is the chair of the Armenian Studies Program at the uh, University of California, Irvine. And like George Clooney and Amal, they were, they were married in Venice. Without any further delay, I'd like to invite Dr. Slanyan to the podium.
thank you very much, Rupen, for that incredibly generous and detailed mini presentation. Um, I'm really flattered by it so much so that uh, perhaps I, I might have lost my train of thought. But uh, uh, first time that I've been compared uh, to, uh, I've been mentioned in the same sentence with Shatner and Clooney, so that's very, very, very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Arad Iskija Museum, particularly Maggie Goshen, as well as Nasser and especially Mark Mamigonian and Rupen uh, Berberian, as well as Bruce Roth for making this event possible. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you here for taking your time on this beautiful Sunday afternoon to be here for my talk. I hope that after that uh, mini, mini presentation, I hope that what I have to say will at least attempt to live up to some of the kind words that were said. So, uh, as Rupen mentioned, my talk today is an offshoot of ongoing work that I've been working on for the past six or seven years directly, and perhaps even 15, 20 years indirectly. And it's a work that is going to materialize in my second book that I'm almost on the, on the cusp of finishing. I hope to be finished with it this summer. It's a book entitled Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512 to 1800. And so uh, my presentation today, the topic of my presentation, uh, Thomas Van Andetti, is an excerpt of sorts from chapter five of my book, which focuses on printing, Armenian printing in Amsterdam that in the 17th century uh, function pretty much like the Mecca for Armenians in terms of cultural production. Amsterdam was the most important center for Armenian printing. And so before I launch directly into the talk, let me say a couple of words very quickly about the larger dimensions of the project that I'm working on and particularly touch upon two factors that have motivated me and driven me to work on this book for uh, as long as I have. So the first thing, the first factor that had drove me to choose this topic, uh, was alluded to by Rupen as well, is the, was the quincentenary of the printing of the first Armenian book in Venice in 1512, a quincentenary milestone that we celebrated at UCLA with the first conference. So at the time there was much discussion and ideas were in the air about what to do about the significance of this larger milestone in Armenian history and how we should celebrate it or how we should study it. And so I decided that I would focus my next book on uh, this topic. The second, um, in the meantime, if I could, I don't have access to the... So in the second factor, one that is perhaps more important and that hardly gets any mention, is the fact that as it's on a personal note, as a descendant of the survivors of the Armenian Genocide, I've always um, thought that we should be, we should remember and celebrate the history that we had before the catastrophic event of 100 years ago, and that uh, we should not reduce Armenian history to those tragic events of four or five years, however grave and important as they may be. And so for that, on a personal note, uh, my book is an attempt to fuse and channel every bit of creative and analytical talent that I might possess into transforming trauma into history, that one that is actually well-written, engaging, uh, and perhaps even inspiring. So I hope that uh, that sets some context in terms of a larger project in this particular presentation. So having said that, let me, let me dive directly into my talk. So on on July the 8th, 1708, a nonagenarian, that is to say a 90-year-old Armenian Archbishop by the name of Thomas of Vanand, Thomas Vanandetti, arrived in the Belgian city of Antwerp, uh, right around there, where he immediately took up residence at the city's local Catholic uh, cathedral. By the time Thomas arrived in Antwerp, he was traveling with two servants, Armenian servants by the name of Pedro Alvarez and Joannes Gaspars, Ovanes Gasparian. By the time he arrived there, he was already uh, ailing old and, uh, old and he had been on the road tramping across Europe and the Ottoman Empire for approximately 40 years in quest of accomplishing his lifelong mission and dream 
that is to say to establish an army and printing press in Amsterdam and to continue the work already done by his spiritual brother Voskan Yerevanti, the printer of the first Armenian Bible, which of course we should know was printed in Amsterdam in 1668. So uh, when he arrived in Antwerp, uh, he was hoping to return finally back to his homeland, uh, Barska Hayastan as he put it, Pers Armenia, Perso Armenia, in Nakhichevan, where he hoped to establish a Latino Armeno college and, trans and transfer his printing press there so that he could launch a cultural revival movement in Nakhichevan. Unfortunately for Thomas, slightly over two months after his arrival, uh, and I should have shown you this earlier, this is going to take up more time than I wanted to, but this is a, a mobile image of our Archbishop moving across uh, the terrain that I mentioned. So. Uh, uh, across all the major nodes, he traveled across Europe, all the major courtly nodes in Europe, 40 years of traveling, and finally reached Amsterdam in 1695. So by the time, so, so Thomas uh, unfortunately fell ill two months after his arrival in Antwerp, and soon after taking his Catholic benediction, uh, he passed away the following day, leaving the custodians of the cathedral no choice but to call the city's local notary public, Jacques Boy, to make a full and detailed inventory of everything the Archbishop had on him as he was traveling. Fortunately for us, uh, Mr. Boy made a detailed inventory, and that inventory ended up in the National Archives in Antwerp, where a few months ago, uh, through some negotiation and pleading with the archivist, I received copies of the documents that were in the inventory, that were that constituted the inventory of Thomas Vartabed. So what was Thomas uh, traveling with? What did he own? What can we tell about his life based on the few things that he thought were worthy enough to, to, to uh, lug around with him? In essence, the inventory indicates to us that Thomas uh, was traveling with three or four leather-bound chests uh, containing multiple copies of newly printed Armenian books, some bound and some unbound, a signal or a, a, a testament to his pioneering years as a printer of re great renown in Amsterdam. But in addition to the books that he was traveling with, Thomas, more interestingly perhaps, was traveling, according to the uh, notary public, traveling with a pouch that contained multiple documents. And these documents are, uh, you can see one of them here, approximately 12 documents, all of them letters of recommendation. Hans Nararagan Kir, to use the Armenian uh, term for it, or Abbas Baranat's Gir, and that uh, included letters of recommendation dating back to the 1660s, approximately 50, more than 50 years, half a century before the Archbishop passed away. Uh, and these are some of them here in the archive. These are copies. These are not the originals. The originals have disappeared, but copies were made by one of, one of his two servants. And this is a power of inter uh, letter of recommendation by Hagop Juhayati, the formidable Armenian Catholicos of the second half of the 17th century. This is one. This is a second uh, letter of recommendation from Hagop Juhayati, and a third. And then we have several uh, non-Armenian letters of recommendation, including a letter of recommendation from the Roman Catholic Cardinal, Ca Cardinal Alderanus de Chibo, known uh, widely as the protector of the Armenians and the Indians, a member of the Propaganda Fide in Rome, whom Thomas Vartabed met in 1678 or 79, when he arrived in Rome from Venice during his peripatetic uh, sojourn across Europe with his two nep uh, nephews, uh, Rukas Vanandesi and Mateus Van uh, Rukas Vanandesi and Mikhail Vanandesi, the, brother the sons of his two brothers, to hand them over essentially to uh, Alderanus Chibo and to the Propaganda Fide for the two youths to receive the best possible education available at the time in Europe, arguably to be educated essentially at the famed Collegio Urbano of Rome where youth from the East, 
especially those belonging to the Eastern Christian churches, were educated in the arts of theology, philosophy, languages, and so forth. And so after depositing these two nephews, Thomas traveled, uh, he continued his journey that took him to uh, spend 10 years in Spain, uh, and then eventually to Amsterdam where he set up a press. So the question, of course, arises when we look at these uh, powers of letters of recommendation, the question arises as to why Thomas felt so uh, the need so much to travel with these letters, these certificates, um, fif sometimes 50 years after they had expired on himself. Why would a man of his stature be traveling across Europe with letters of recommendation? More so, one could say, could these letters of recommendation uh, shed any light on Thomas's life as an itinerant pilgrim and printer? Could the letters of recommendation have anything to tell us about uh, how they helped him accomplish his life go lifelong mission, that is to say the establishment of a vibrant printing press in Amsterdam? These are some of the questions that my study uh, in the longer version seeks to address and I essentially focus on the genre of the epistolary genre of the letter of recommendation the Hans Naragan Kier, as a locus for network building for travelers and pilgrims who travel across the word, world, and as a means of uh, garnering to them support and help and trust from people they never knew before. So, but before I launch into Thomas's life in more detail and tell you a bit about Armenian printing history, let me say a few words about the early modern world. The, for the Armenians, the space of this early modern world through which Thomas traveled. So the early modern world, and by early modern, uh, what I mean to say, of course, is the, con the periodization scheme according to world historians or global historians that essentially refers to events that unfolded in world history, roughly speaking, between 1500 and 1800, the 300 year period just before the full onset of modernity with the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. In the early modern world, the Armenians had established a vibrant diaspora, as I mentioned earlier, and, and so this was the world through which Thomas traveled with the help of letters of recommendation. What did this world look like? How was it constituted? How did it, what was its genesis? How did it emerge? And what can it possibly tell us today living in the in the modern world of the Armenian diaspora, the post-genocide world. This is a diaspora that is less known. Most people have forgotten its existence. But it's a diaspora in some ways similar to the diaspora of the 20th century. Uh, it is a society like our own society that is a society of mobility, a society, an arena of settlement across the world where merchants, missionaries and printers are constantly mobile. They move from one location to another, taking with them fresh ideas, rumor, gossip, uh, sometimes skills, sometimes books like Thomas Van and uh, also in some cases also uh, they attempt to take printing presses with them. Uh, so what did this world look like and how did it come about? Essentially this world, which is the larger object of my next book, uh, was essentially consisted of, roughly speaking, 60 separate nodes, 60 settlements, community settlements, scattered across vast global spaces from the Indian Ocean world all the way to the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Roughly speaking, from London to London, Cadiz in Western Europe to Guangzhou, that is today, today's Guangzhou, or Canton, China, and Manila, the Philippines. Across this wide, Spectrum, there were about 60 important settlements where Armenia thrived, and these settlements ranged in size from the smallest of 20 people, uh, in the case of Manila, the Philippines, and Guangzhou, China, to middle-sized settlements like 100, or small-sized settlements like 100, like Venice, Livorno, Marseille, and Amsterdam. Amsterdam, despite all the accomplishments that I'm going to be hailing and talking about today, had only 80 Armenians at its peak. So a very tiny community, but of course the moral lesson here is that Armenians, as most of us already probably know, always punch above their weight. That is to say, it do doesn't take too many Armenians to accomplish uh, cultural feats. Uh, and uh, I'm saying this as a historian and not as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone wearing an Armenian hat. Uh, so, uh, 
So there are 60 settlements scattered across oceans, and these 60 settlements and the diaspora that they constituted essentially were born and came about, was born and came about at a specific time and place in world history. The time is basically the period from 1596 to 1606, that 10 year period in world history from 1596 to 1606, when in the homeland of the Armenians on the Armenian plateau and in the neighboring Eastern Anatolian uh, regions where many Armenians live, two important what I call detonations of mobility took place that together conspired to launch to, uh, to set in motion a series of migrations, forced migrations, that led later on were morphed into voluntary migrations of merchants and missionaries that resulted in the creation of two types of diasporas that together comprised one larger global Armenian diaspora. The two events that I'm referring to are first uh, and most well-known case of the, the, uh, uh, the Buyuk Sürgün, or the great deportations established by Shah Abbas I, the formidable ruler of the Safavid Empire of Iran, who in the process of his wars against the Ottoman Empire in 1604-1603, uh, forcibly displaced and forcibly marched somewhere around 300,000 Armenians and others from the neighbor, uh, frontier region of the two empires and resettled them in Iran. As we know, this is a deportation that has received considerable attention. I myself devoted my first book to this topic to a large extent and the diaspora that this deportation created. This deportation created, of course, the Eastern Armenian diaspora, the uh, Barskahai diaspora that went on to, uh, and here is a visual uh, fancy reconstruction of this. Basically, the, dip the region that I'm referring to is here. This is uh, the Armenian plateau and the eastern fringes of the Anatolian, of the Asia Minor or Ana Eastern Anatolia, from where these two deportations, these two detonations of, uh, displaced several hundred thousand Armenians resulting in the diaspora. The first one resulted in the Armenians moving from old Julfa and other re and neighboring regions, Yerevan, Nakhichevan, and so on, to uh, Isfahan, where they formed a small community in a very affluent uh, suburb of Isfahan known as Norjua or New Jufa. That community itself later on, after the initial trauma of the forced deportations, went on to establish voluntary, deport, uh, voluntary settlements across the Indian Ocean Basin in places like Surat, Kalkara, uh, Madras, and so on, and then further afield to Guang Guangzhou, China, and Manila, Manila, Philippines. Some of them even went to Acapulco, but they didn't have any communities there. Uh, but this is only one part of the diaspora history. This is the Eastern Armenian diaspora. The other diaspora history, which, is, which has not received the attention it deserves or merits, is the creation of the Western Armenian diaspora. Uh, the very diaspora to which I would assume most people in this room, in one way or another, are connected. And that, deport that diaspora resulted from a similar detonation of forced mobility. And this was the detonation that occurred as a result of a series of armed uprisings across eastern Anatolia, the eastern fringes of the Ottoman Empire, uh, so beginning in 1596 and culminating in 1606, sometimes even going further than that to the 1620s or 30s. But for most historians, the period that really matters the most is 1596 to 1606. And these deportations were, these displacements were the result of a movement in Ottoman history that Ottoman historians refer, refer to as the Jalali uprisings. They're basically uprisings, uh, insurrections, uh, rebellions uh, on behalf of armed marauders, band, bandits who were armed with guns and so forth that took power from the centralizing uh, Ottoman Empire centered in Istanbul and through most of Eastern Anatolia in a period of chaos. Uh, and the result of the chaos and the, uh, the violence that ensued in the 10, 15, 20 years of this period was that uh, tens of thousands of people who lived in Eastern Anatolia, not just Armenians but also others, uh, were forced to fly to basically were forced to leave their homes in the rural areas of Anatolia 
and find safer havens sheltered in the empire's more stable, more protected domains, such as Istanbul, Izmir, or Constantinople and Smyrna, and further afield in the Balkans. In this, this is a period that's referred to in Ottoman historiography in Turkish as the Buyuk Kachgun, or the, the Great Flight, the dispersion of tens of thousands of people. And in this dispersion, there were somewhere around 40 to 60,000 Armenians living in the Armenian Plateau or the eastern fringes of Anatolia, who also became swept up in this larger flight and left their eastern uh, home, uh, homestead and migrated in search of safety. They ended up in Istanbul and Izmir and Rodosto and uh, most of Rumelia, the Balkans, and so on. So most of the communities that we take for granted today as being hardcore uh, centers of Western Armenian life, where Western Armenian culture came to flourish in the 17th and 18th centuries, were actually created as a result of the Buyut Kachgun of the Jalalis. To give you some examples, uh, the population of Constantinople, Istanbul. In 1604, the Polish Armenian traveler and pilgrim, Simeon Lehatsi, Simeon of Poland, arrived in Constantinople and duly noted the characteristics of the Armenian population. He said, there are 80 houses of Armenians. There were 80 houses of Armenians in Istanbul in 1604. Utsun Dun Hai which, if we take five to be the uh, reasonable rate of conversion, would be 400 Armenians in 1604, before 1604, before er the arrival of Simeon Lehansi. But he says, in the recent year, a year or two before my arrival, there 40,000 Armenians arrived from the east. And the population of Armenians has swelled to 40,000 plus. The same uh, Simeon Lehansi, Simeon Lehansi, Simeon of Poland. Uh, who was a traveler and pilgrim. So uh, his account is available in English translation. George Bournuthian has produced a, a very reliable uh, account of this in English if, for those interested. The same can be said for Izmir, Smyrna, where the population was minuscule of Armenians at least. And then after 1604, with the arrival of the migrants from the east, the population increased to 10,000 Armenians. And the same story can be repeated on and on. The important thing is that after they settled there, some of these merchants, some of these people became transformed from peasants into urbanites. And in, as urbanites, urban um, uh, residents, they quickly came to transform themselves, in some cases, into merchants. And they went on to populate the Western Armenian diaspora in Europe, where they eventually met up with the Jokmans who already settled there as a byproduct of the Jahasha Abbas deportation. So in sum, without belaboring this point too much, uh, I can, uh, I'll wrap this sec segment up by saying that out of the 60 settlements that comprise the early modern Armenian diaspora, somewhere around most of them, the majority of them, happen to be located in port cities, that is to say in cities on the edges of oceans and seas or rivers in some cases. Uh, this is the case in the Indian Ocean, certainly the case in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic seaboard and so forth. Only a minority of these settlements were inland. But what is more important for our purposes here is the realization that in this diasporic space, the space through which our central hero and character, Thomas Vartabed, traveled, uh, Armenian printers set up printing presses in 21 separate locations. And out of, these, out of these 21 locations, 16 or 17, that is to say the vast, overwhelming majority, were printing presses that were set up in port cities. Port cities like Venice, Livorno, Marseille, Madras, Calcutta, Astrakhan, and a few others that I could mention. But none of these port cities even came close to competing with Amsterdam as being the most important center for Armenian period, uh, printing during this period. And so this is where naturally our printer here, uh, missionary, the non engineerian Thomas Wartabet of, of the hamlet of Banan in Nakhichevan would naturally gravitate to. And he went there, he arrived in 1695, and he did so. Um, and when he did so, he found himself in a well-established Armenian little diaspora. Amsterdam, like I mentioned, was a mid-small-sized community. 
with no more than 80 Armenian full-time residents. There might have been a few more coming and going, but 80 full-time residents are listed in the records of the Amsterdam Municipal Archives as being permanent residents there. And despite their small numbers though, and this is a lesson for everyone to learn from, they had two different churches, especially this church here, which has the Lamb of God on its entrance here, which is also on uh, an embroidery in the back. Uh, and it's known as the Church of Surpoki or Saint Holy Spirit, established in 1714 through the expenses of a Jolfan merchant, by, my, by uh, hands down my favorite Jolfan merchant, a man by the name of Koji Baba, or Khoja Baba Sultanun, who was a very wealthy merchant who founded the settlement here in the church, as well as uh, played an important role in multiple theaters, like most Armenians of this period. So uh, this is a, a 17th century sketch of the church. The inside of the church, the church is opened. I was just there two months ago, and I went to Mass on April the 24th, 23rd, on a Sunday. So Thomas Wartabin arrived in this place, and when he arrived, he found himself to be the third or fourth major printer in Amsterdam. His path to Amsterdam was paved by earlier uh, adventurers and cultural producers. And some of them merit uh, some attention here. Uh, the first printer to establish a f setting, a permanent setting on Dutch soil in Amsterdam, who was Armenian, was Mateus Tsaretsi. And uh, I would bet that very few people, if anyone here, would know where Tsar is. Tsar today is a uh, little known place. It's not known for being a cultural beacon or uh, one of the most advanced places on the planet. It's basically a small town, village, not too far from Kelbajar, Karbajar, on the outskirts of Karabakh. So the first printer who went to Amsterdam was Mateus Tsaretsi, Mateus Tsar, who arrived in Amsterdam in 1658, and like everybody before him who had been sent there, had been sent there by the Armenian Catholicos, in this case, of Philippos, I think, and first destination for Mateus was Italy, the Italian peninsula, where the center of printing was located at the time, Venice and Rome. And after arriving in Rome, Mateus realized that despite every effort that he made to get the Armenian Bible printed, he, was, he found himself facing a wall. Every, single, every turn that he took, he was faced with a wall, an obstacle, obstruction. And it didn't take him too long to have a light bulb flash in his head with a great idea that is to say that I think there is one thing in common I have, I'm facing here, that is I'm facing obstacles and opposition to printing the Armenian Bible because of censorship from the Church of Rome. So being very smart, what he did was he did what the Jews did. He said, I will, for some reason, we don't know the p passive information that led him to this conclusion, but he decided to relocate his base and his quest away from Rome to a place that didn't have censorship or that had very little censorship. And that place, of course, was the Dutch, was the Netherlands, and at the time, the hub, the global center of global capitalism, Amsterdam itself, where Jewish printers had been printing books from 1625 onwards without any hindrance or opposition from censors. They too were operating in Italy before, but they, they shifted base to Amsterdam. So the Armenians followed them 30 years later. And Mateos from Tsari, was the first to, came to, to come to this conclusion. So he arrived and set up a printing press with the help of merchants and so on, and eventually had Armenian characters, uh, punch cutter, a punch, had a, a specialized punch cutter, punch cut Armenian characters, Armenian letters, the most expensive part of printing, the most difficult obstacle in the way of most printers. Once the punch cutter did his job, a very, very well-known, famed uh, punch cutter by the name of Christopher Van Dyck, who Van Dyck, who is a, a work for the Elsevier firm of printers. He then began to print uh, his first book, Jesus Orti, Jesus the Son, and he died before the book was finished. And he died on his deathbed. There were creditors, Armenian creditors, who had loaned him money and so forth, asking for the, their money back. And at that point appeared before him a merchant from Jofa, the brother of Voskhan Yerevansi, the famed printer of the Bible, who said, I am willing to help you. I'm going to purchase the printing press from you, but under one condition. I'll pay for all the expenses, but the printing press will go to my brother in Yerevan, 
Voskan Yerevanti, who is the leader of the Ushi in Saint of Saint Sarkis in what is today Armenia, north of not too far from Echmiati. And uh, Mateos agreed. Uh, his brother Voskan's brother purchased the press and began printing books. In that press, printed the Armenian Bible in 1688. Printed also, and you can see an image here of the Bible here. And also printed the first work of Armenian history in the early modern period. The Girk Batmutian, the Book of History of Arakel of Tabriz, Arakel Tabrizeti, which also happens to be the first book printed while the author was still alive. So, uh, so we have Mamor Mateo Tsareti, followed by Boskan Bartabe de Revanti. Then, then in 1685, after a hiatus of about 10 years, where the printing press was not operating in, in Amsterdam because of bankruptcies and so on, Boskan had moved this press to Livorno and from Livorno to Marseille where he had also problems with censorship. Uh, during this 10 to 15 year period, there was no Armenian printing in Amsterdam. During this period, uh, Mateos Vanandeti, the cousin, first cousin of Thomas Vanandeti, arrived from Marseille. He had been trained as a typesetter by Voskan Yerevanti under the tutelage and guidance of his older cousin, Thomas. Arrived in Amsterdam and purchased new fonts. New, he had a new punch cutter cut font in a printing press and began to continue the work that Voskan had done. And he ran into some problems, financial problems, a few years later. This is where Thomas Vartabet comes into the, into the picture. He arrives in 1695 after spending 40 years or so, 30 or so years traveling across Europe, trying to raise money so he wouldn't be at the mercy of Armenian patriots, merchant patriots. In general, I should say, without belaboring the point too much, that Armenian merchants uh, were pivotal and necessary in the launching of Armenian print culture across the diaspora. Without printers, without merchants, there would be no print culture, probably, because they were always the ones who bankrolled printing presses. They commissioned books. They helped printers buy pun uh, punches and create punch, uh, fonts and so forth. Or printing presses, they paid for their expenses. And often, printing was not a lucrative business. That's an understatement. Printing was actually al almost always a business that was uh, destined for bankruptcy. The market of readers were minuscule. Armenian readers constituted a very small amount in a vast ocean of illiteracy. So printers were very uh, merchants were very important in subsidizing printing. But of course, uh, the relationship between printers and uh, mer uh, merchants and printers was not always rosy. right? There's a, I call the princes Port Armenians because they mostly lived in port cities. There were Chofans as well as uh, Western Armenians from the Ottoman Empire. But, all cities for the most part, or as many counties. But of course, the relationship, as necessary as it was, often led to uh, litigation, long litigation, court cases in uh, uh, foreign courts, which bankrupted the printers and so forth. And this was the problem of Thomas Vartabet's cousin, Mateos Vanandeti. He went into business with a couple of Jofan merchants who made him very sorry for, for engaging with them, partnering up with them to produce books. Uh, they ended up in the courts. Mateos almost lost his press, and then Thomas knew about this, and so Thomas decided, being one of the early uh, visionaries in this, he thought there was a problem with this, the relationship between port cities and printers that sometimes ended up in court cases and bankruptcy. So he decided to have an alternative recourse to patronage. His recourse was to avoid Armenian merchants and to print things from his own pocket. But he could only have money if he had patronage from Catholic uh, authorities in Europe. So he traveled to Rome, spent 10 years in Spain. He was in Lisbon, Sevilla, Granada, Madrid, and Coruña in the north. And this whole time that he was in Spain 10 years, he was essentially looking for patrons particularly through the Spanish king Charles the first, Ch uh, sorry Charles the second, to have money given to him on the basis of patronage. The same thing he did in Rome as well, except that when he was with Roman authorities, with Catholic authorities, he never said that his goal was to print books because he knew that they would automatically obstruct him because of censorship. He came up with other stories about why he needed the money that included re reviving his church that had been uh, languishing and transcaucasia under the domination and usurpation of Muslim authorities and so forth, so Christian authorities felt that they could subsidize him without knowing that the money was actually going towards printing. 
And so after 10, 15 years or 30, 40 years of traveling, he finally arrived in, Am in Amsterdam, and the first thing he did was he printed this well-known atlas, the first Armenian atlas, the cover of my book. It's called Hamadaras Ashkara Tweet, was the atlas of the world printed in 1695. Uh, shortly after this, uh, this was commissioned, this was actually engraved on bronze with the help of famous Dutch engravers, two brothers named, uh, who were known as the Schoenbeck or Schoenbeck brothers. Um, and soon afterwards, the next year, he printed probably the most important book of his career, a book that has gone on to remake Armenian history, literally. And that is the famous work by Moses of Choren, Moses Chorenazis, Bat Mutyun Hayot, which was, of course, at the time known as Aska Bat Mutyun, Tohmin, Hapetian, Chorenazal, Moses Chorenazi. So, Aska Bat Mutyun, Tohmin, Hapetian, the genealogy of the Japhetian uh, race or clan or uh, nation. Uh, the Armenians were known as Japhetian because they're descended from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, Jacob and also uh, Noah, 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 Noah's, yeah, sorry. So uh, this book is, went on to become very, very important in re the remaking of Armenian culture in the 1700s and 1600s. He also printed in 1699 uh, under the influence of guidance of his nephew who had joined him at that time, Hukas and, Mat uh, Hukas and Mikhail had been educated in Rome, joined Thomas Vartabed in Sevilla in Spain, translated for him before the Spanish court. Um, and so uh, they joined, Rugas joined him in Amsterdam and took over the printing from his great uncle and began to author works of his own, usually philosophical manuals, but also a great deal, a great number of religious uh, works as well. So uh, in all the, during all of these travels, Thomas, in incredibly enough, had time to publish two memoirs, two autobiographies that detailed the peripatetic course that his life took after he left his hamlet of Vanan. And these two memoirs are the one to the left, is the one that's well known, is a, la a memoir in Latin uh, called Reverendissimi in Christo Patris, published and printed in London in 1707, when Thomas visited London and Queen Anne for help again, and then with his nephew Lucas of Vannan, went to Oxford and was given an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. And during his presentation of the diploma, he actually presented this memoir that he had published with the help of Lucas, who was fluent in Latin. So this has been known before me. Uh, several people have worked on it, but never translated into English. Uh, Grigorian, the Lusahoki, uh, Mesrop Grigorian, who passed away, I think, uh, six, six months or so ago, uh, was the first to blaze the path to the study of his work. But this one on the left side was not known until a few months ago, and this is a memorial that he printed in Spanish when he approached the king of Spain, um, Don Carlos II. And it's a Spanish language memoir that is preserved at the uh, Biblioteca Nacional de Madrid which I also, uh, 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 through negotiation over uh, online and so on, the director of the library managed to get a copy of. So both of these accounts contain, give us a fairly detailed, uh, textured understanding of Thomas's journeys and so forth. So uh, let me conclude with some concluding thoughts about Thomas's larger, uh, the meaning, the larger meaning of Thomas's life and the importance of print culture for the Armenians. And at the risk of uh, indulging or inundating you with too much text, uh, let me read a small fragment from this passage from Thomas's Latin language memoir published in London that gives us a good sense of how his life fit into the early modern period of Armenian printing in the diaspora. And he says here, about 40 years ago, this is in Latin, I'm reading it to you in translation that I had uh, arranged uh, for someone to undertake for me. About 40 years ago, I, the writer of the following, an unworthy servant of the servants of God, thirsting after the good arts, formed a plan with two other fellow brothers in Christ and fellow doctors in the Aramean church, it should read Armenian church, 
uh, that each of us would, according to our strengths, direct our hands to promoting and stabilizing the study of the good arts, uh, the, uh, to the, uh, the good arts, uh, uh, to, um, in greater Armenia. And then he says, then, and he basically gives an account in this, in the part that I've put in ellipses, he gives an account of Boskan Yerevanti, his brother, his spiritual brother, and so on, and how he took his two nephews from Banand and dropped them at the Ur Colegio Urbano School and then went on his business trying to collect funds and so forth. So I'll, I skipped that part. Then he says, then, since we perceived the necessity of bringing youths so out of Armenia, we might who might in Europe be steeped in the disciplines and the good arts, it was agreed between us that I ought to return to our homeland in order to summon youths. So I guess I'm not skipping this part. And thus in the year 1673, separated from my one and only brother, fellow brother, I arrived through Italy, Austria, Poland, Wallachia, at Constantinople, and finally to my homeland where as much as I could, I zealously urged our neighbors and ecclesiastical acquaintances to aid what I could to aid what we, we had begun, showing them how many advantages our church would obtain and how much easier it would be for us before other Orientals, this is an important line, to collect these fruits of Europe, filled with virtues and disciplines. By the fruits of Europe, he means, of course, technology of print established by Gutenberg in the 1450s. And so uh, this context that sets the larger um, framework of Thomas's activities as a pioneer, cultural maker, cultural producer, and so on, uh, was not something that happened in isolation from what, what other Armenians were thinking. In the early modern period, a number of Armenians separated from each other by great distances, a number of elite Armenians, cultural producers, had this idea in their heads that they were going to rescue Armenian culture from fragmentation and oblivion, and they did so through collecting manuscripts initially by focusing their activities in places like Baresh, the shores of southern shores of Lake Van, Bitlis, collecting manuscripts from Armenian monasteries and reconstituting a canon of Armenian literature, including historical works such as Horenati, uh, Papstos Pizan, Agatankevos, and many other historians. And their editions have come down to us uh, largely through the work of the school of Baresh that uh, Nestes Aguinian, the uh, scholar and monk belonging to the Machitarist order of Vienna, uh, has studied in his book, Bagheshi Tebrotze. But this was, an, this was one part of a larger cultural revival project that focused on manuscripts. What is even more important is that in the post-manuscript era, in the era of Gutenberg with print, uh, visionaries like Thomas Wartabed and Boskan uh, Yerevanti uh, also had the same idea of totalizing an Armenian archive, an Armenian canon of works that were on the verge of disappearance into permanent memory by putting them into print. And so Thomas's activities can be seen in this larger context. And I'll end with one or two, one vignette about how this is really important, how this, is, how this figures importantly in Thomas's life. And the vignette that I have has to do with the book that I mentioned earlier, which is the this foundational text, the Askapanutin Domin Apetian, the history of the uh, history of Armenia by Mofses Horenati, the fifth century, some people say seventh century author, who wrote the first national kind of history of the Armenians the, uh, from their origins from Noah until uh, the, the the late and uh, until the antique late antique period. So this work. Uh, which is foundational for Armenian historical memory, would have probably been lost to us had it not been for the fact that Thomas Wartabed decided to travel across Europe during those 40 years of peregrinations with a copy of a manuscript in his pocket that he had taken from Nachichevan before he left. He had the manuscript of Moses Horinati with him in Spain when he approached Don Carlos II. And his goal was to print this book before it disappeared, before copies of manuscripts uh, uh, were consigned to oblivion through destruction or just lost. And when he arrived in Asheram, he printed this pronto. The first thing he did was to print this. And why is this important, you might ask? It's important because in the 18th century, Europeans and Armenians alike 
were made aware of the existence of Thomas of Moses Khorinati's history largely, largely as a result of this printing of the the Editio Princeps, the first edition of this work in Amsterdam in 1695. Uh, you might ask, how do you, how do I know this? I'm, and to which I might add, uh, I know this because other printing printings or editions of Khorinati, such as the edition of 1736, when Khorinati was published for the first time into a European language, not English, but Latin, by the Winston brothers, two Englishmen in London who had studied Armenian through the help of grammar books and so forth. The Winston brothers' uh, uh, edition of Khorinati was based exclusively on the ed original edition of Amsterdam, which contained many flaws and so on, according to them, which they left as is. Point being that they did not have a manuscript of Khorinati with them in London. The earlier edition of the 1733 translation into Latin, in part, part, partial translation in Latin by a Swedish author in Stockholm, 1733, predating the Winston brothers and one that hardly ever gets any mention, was also based on the 1695 edition. More importantly, the 1752 edition in Venice of Moses Khorinati about Nichon Hayat, printed in Venice uh, with the help and commissioning of a Constantinople-based Armenian uh, duke of sorts, the Marchese, uh, I'm going to forget his name at the moment, uh, uh, Giovanni di Serpos, Jovanes Serbosian. That edition, 1752, was also based entirely on the edition that Thomas Vartabed had printed, meaning that if Thomas had not printed this book in 1695, the chances are manuscript copies might have survived or they may not have survived. But it is important that his publication permanently fixed Thomas uh, Moses Khorinati's history as part of the larger canon of Armenian memory and history. So I will end with that. If you have any questions, I welcome them and thank you for your patience. opportunity to clarify something. Um, the Antwerp archives had also been studied by um, this Belgian scholar in 1905 or 1907, Jules Vanerus, published an article in French in a journal, in an obscure kind of specialized journal, on these documents. Uh, and he essentially argued that the originals were not there, including the original of the Queen Anne letter of recommendation from London. Uh, and his assumption was that uh, when the notary public arrived, the servants who were traveling with Thomas Vartabed, his Armenian assistants, who were young, decided to take the original copies with them, but before doing so, at the behest of the uh, notary public, they sat down and copied the originals in Armenian. Uh, the Latin originals were uh, copied by the notary public and notarized, but the originals were copied by, by uh, the uh, either Thomas, uh, either Alvarez, Pedros Arva Alvarez, or Jovanes Gasparian, which explains why uh, there are numerous uh, uh, grammatical mistakes in the in the letter of recommendations that Voskanir that uh, Hagop Jovaiti wrote. So we don't know where they went. I suppose they, uh, the arch archivist says that they traveled with the rest of the. Archbishop's original papers back to their homeland. But fortunately, copies were made. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. yes uh, give your name. Uh, Onik. 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 Yeah, yes. Uh, we know that uh, Thomas Vanantes, he assisted Johann Schroeder yes. in forming his uh, grammar of the Armenian of course. Kant's uh, Aramian de Zee. Uh, and uh, Hugas uh, Vanantes, uh, who was uh, a person of wide knowledge, mm -hmm. and he has a philosophical and uh, uh, scientific interest also, uh, introduced Godfrey Wilhelm Leibniz 
to uh, to his uncle Thomas. Yes. And uh, so, uh, I mean, it's uh, can you elaborate on this uh, phenomena that Van uh, I mean, they, they were also uh, forerunners of archaeological study. Of course, definitely, it's an excellent question uh, and comment. So, essentially, uh, the the, uh, the uh, Assessores de Lingua Armenicae, or the Ganga Romiandes V that you mentioned that was written in 17, I think 17, or oh, early 1700s, my memory fails me at the moment, uh, was essentially a grammar manual written in Latin of the classical Armenian language as well as the Jufa dialect, which is how I know this manual, because it's a useful place for those who know nothing about Jufa dialect to uh, sharpen, the, cut their teeth. Uh, so this was done by uh, Schroeder, this German scholar who was living in Amsterdam at the time who studied classical Armenian at the foot, at the feet of Thomas Van Andetti as well as Lucas who was a young, a young man at this time. And why is this important you may say? It's important because it connects to a part of my, a small segment of the story that I told. It connects to the fact that the Winston brothers who translated Thomas Van Andetti, uh, Moses Horinati first into Latin in London in 1736. Their principal way, medium, their principal source for learning Armenian, classical Armenian, was actually the Thesaurus de Lingua Armenicae. And they say this in, in various letters that I've been working on this. It's a pet project of mine for the last few months. So they, they learned Armenian through this Thesaurus as well as many other there are several other cases I know of off the top of my head of people who learned Armenian as a result of this grammar manual as well as dictionaries that were published in Europe at this time. There was a Jacques Villot dictionary of Armenian Latin as well as a few other dictionaries. And absolutely spot on, you're absolutely right that the Vanandesis were forerunners in Armenian studies. They laid the basis for Armenological studies in Europe in a way that, let's say, European Orientalism or Orientalists who study the Orient in Oriental languages like Arabic, Persian, and so forth were also at this time coming into fruition in Europe. So Armenia was a small branch of this. And the mediators, the go-betweens in all this were people like dynamic, dynamic people and border crosses, mo mobile individuals, transcultural individuals like Thomas Van and his and his larger family. Uh, maybe I have really several questions. Yes, Rafi. Can I make a comment also? Yes, let me first go to Rafi. Yes, please. I uh, don't have any questions from you. Please. This is at the very period when uh, the Dutch were establishing their empire all over the world. Maybe yes. Maybe they said they just want Amsterdam to come first. I mean, it's a world war here. They're competing with the, the Hispanics. They're competing with England. Yes, good question. Obviously, um, to answer your question about the Dutch, uh, the Dutch East India Company, known popularly as the VOC, I've used the Dutch acronym for it, uh, founded in 1602 in Amsterdam, was throughout all of the 1600s, throughout the first, the, f the entirety of the 17th century, the leading corporation in the world. It was one of the first joint stock corporations, if not the first, and the Dutch were basically in the position of, in the pole position of being the, hege the global hegemons. They were in charge of the global economy. So the English only came to re displace them much later after the 1720s. So to answer your question, the Armenians obviously knew that the Dutch East India Company was very active in India. This was their playground. The Armenians were there before the Europeans. But when the Europeans showed up, at some point or another, they realized that 
the only game in town that, that's actually succeeding continuously, not just a one-off success, but continuous success, were, was the model of the European Joint Stock Corporation, the Dutch being principal among uh, the leading ones among this, among them. And so they knew very well where Amsterdam, that Amsterdam was a thriving center, and they decided as early as 1620, there were two Armenians, 1625 in Amsterdam, uh, and after the 1660s, 1658 period, uh, and afterwards, uh, um, 40 or up to 60 Armenians settled there, and most of them were there because they knew that they could take their Persian silk, raw silk, from Iran, transport it across the Russian route north, through Astrakhan to Moscow, St. Petersburg, and from there via the, the Black, the, uh, the Baltic Sea, to straight to Amsterdam, and sell it in Amsterdam at this really burgeoning, really developed market uh, for, for trade. And then they would then purchase Dutch materials and then via Russia ship them down to Israel. So they, they're very well aware. And even someone like Matteo Zaretti knew from, from channels that we do not know exactly that Amsterdam was a better place to have to set the foundations for Armenian print than Italy because of censorship. So information channels were totally available to them. Information is circulating mobile along with the people. This is a society of mobility. The whole early modern period is principled, is predicated on the idea of movement of information, goods, uh, c commodities, diseases, sometimes men, of course, uh, and ideas. So, and I forget your second question? The Spanish autobiographical oh, work. Yes. Uh, certainly, this work was written by Rugas van Andetti, and in the memoir itself, Thomas said that his cousin, his nephew, had helped him basically craft this narrative in Spanish. Rugas f spoke fluent Spanish in Latin. They were educated in Rome for at least five to ten years, I think. And they're quite, quite uh, intelligent young boys at the time. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first, uh, th th uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, description of Armenian genius uh, uh, in this area of printing, particularly um, that you helped us understand. Um, the name of the first movable type person in Germany was Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg. Yes. He had a similar problem with merchants that you described. How Armenians had problem with merchants who came to lend money and then took the printer to court when negotiations were not successful. Gutenberg had an assistant, a young man whom he trained. He trained in the technique and the skills of using the movable type to print the first Bible, for example, in German, as you know, in the city of Frankfurt on Main in Germany. Okay. However, when the merchant came to lend Gutenberg money to extend his printing to other books, this young assistant secretly worked with the merchants, saying, look, I know how to do this. Let's have a partnership, you and me, and leave Gutenberg out. And in fact, this is what they did. And poor Gutenberg lived very in great poverty. One of the greatest men who has ever lived in the history of the world, and certainly one of the greatest names in German history, lived in poverty for more than 20 years before he could get funds to have his own printing press. So that kind of lack of moral authority mm -hmm. existed then and continues to exist now. And what, what I think we ought to do as Armenians is learn from the lessons of the past. First of all, we've got to learn to honor the golden rule of loving ourselves and the Creator and each other that the Creator loves by working collaboratively together, not competing with each other. and that. Together, we are likely to create heaven on earth, a paradise on earth that we I are cannot, capable of. I cannot agree with you more. Yes, absolutely. Everything you said about Gutenberg is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, quite accurate. Uh, and 
if only what you say in the second part, if only others also listen to it. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, we know that until 1789, the Mechitarists of Venice, they didn't have their own printing line of press, sorry. And they used uh, to print their books in by uh, uh, other uh, printers in Venice, like Antonio Bartoli. Bartoli, yes. Bartoli, yes. At the beginning, I mean, all of them, all of them, all of them, uh, all of them. All of them, yes. Bartoli, yes. <laughs> and uh, they somehow managed to acquire uh, the printing press of uh, Matteo Zaretti, mm -hmm. who died in, uh, sorry, Matteo who died in 1710. And it was seized by the creditors, mm -hmm. this printing press. Exactly. Yeah. Can you give us yes. details about yes. uh, this transaction, please? I can. Uh, because, uh, uh, sorry, because, I mean, when you look at the, uh, at the uh, quality yes. of the books yeah. by uh, the Mechitarists, at this period, after acquiring this press, mm -hmm. it's very uh, uh, high quality. Yes. And we know that uh, Mat uh, Matthias ordered a Hungarian yes. by the name of Kish something. Kish. Nicolaus yes. Nistofalusi Kish. Yes, to uh, prepare for him special print fonts. Yes. Uh, so, uh, can you elaborate? Sure. Give us some sure, very good question. Uh, so, essentially, uh, yes, 1685, when Matthias Matteo was basically, uh, as the cousin, uh, first cousin of Thomas, was taken by Thomas on his first journey. Thomas made two journeys. The first journey he took Matteo. He took him to Marseille because he knew that at the time, 17, 1670, dropped him off in, in Marseille, 1672, I think, with his brother in arms, his brother in spirit, Foscani Evanti, who had relocated his place there. And Matteo trained with Voscan and became the most preeminent uh, typographer, type, typesetter of his age. He was known as uh, uh, the Bakrich Gadarian. He was a really a perfect printer, typesetter. So he studied with Voskan for 15 or so years. Um, after he finished with Voskan, Voskan's press went bankrupt after Voskan died. There were litigations, extreme censorship by a uh, uh, a couple of Armenian censors who were sent from Rome to, uh, to survey Voskhan's activities and they did everything possible, went out of their way to obstruct this process from fully reaching fruition. So in 1683, the press basically collapsed. It continued for another three years, but it was essentially no longer what it was. And that's when uh, Mateus of uh, Vanandetti, who had been sent there by, by his cousin Thomas, decided to join his cousin in, in Spain. So he left Marseille in 1684, 85, I think, 84, went to Lisbon, joined them there, and then they traveled together to Coruña, and then by ship, Mateus uh, went ahead of Thomas and established the press in 1685 in Amsterdam. And as you point out, he contacted uh, Nicolaus Mistofalusi Kish, this well-known typesetter, who was of Hungarian origin, printed the first Hungarian Bible in Amsterdam. He crafted new, new Armenian type for, uh, for Mateus. And then Mateus decided he didn't, Mateus realized he didn't have enough funding, and so he didn't have a choice but to go into a partnership agreement with two other Armenians. One was a, a priest from Kayseri, Gesaria, if I'm not mistaken. The second one was a merchant from Jufa. And that merchant, unfortunately, uh, made Mateus's life miserable because uh, their, their books became lost in an earthquake in Izmir, Smyrna, 1688, went bankrupt, and the merchant sued Mateus in the courts, almost robbed him of everything he had worked for. And that's when Thomas decided that he would no longer rely on merchants. So fast forward 50 or so years, 1729, after the bankruptcy of Mateus' uh, press and the confiscation of his type, the most expensive part of printing, by the creditors, Mechitar Sepastia, Mechitar Sepastati comes onto the scene, the greatest cultural hero of his age, uh, without a doubt, and realize, and begins to print books through the printing presses of Italians in Venice, in mainland Venice. Right? They didn't have a printing press of their own until 1689, as you pointed out. 
So they were, Venice had a, a system of privilege printing where they would give monopoly by the Senate to individual printers for 10 years or 20 years. And so Machitar uh, went to his favorite printers. One of them who had a monopoly was Antonio Bortoli and his family. They printed for 100 years with some interruptions, uh, printing Armenian and Greek books. So uh, to make the expenses lower, to reduce the expenses of printing books with uh, Bortoli, Mojita knew that if he supplied, let's say, his own paper, if he supplied especially his own funds, the price of the printing would drop drastically. So at that point, uh, going back to the question that uh, our friend Rafi raised earlier, information networks, Mojita knew from his own information networks, through merchants who were faithfully reporting to him all the time, that especially an Armenian merchant in Amsterdam at the time in the 1720s, I forget his name now, that some creditor has Armenian font and that it might be worthwhile looking into it. So Mokhitar said, okay, I have the Mokhitar's letters, by the way. Mokhitar said, look into it, please, and offer him this much. Do not offer him a cent more than this. So that printer eventually managed to buy the Mistof Palusi Kish's fonts, the pipes, and managed to ship it to Mokhitar. Mokhitar printed books with it. So most of the Mokhitar's books that were published in the 18th century, one would say, were probably printed uh, through the fonts that Mateus uh, of Vanan, our Thomas's cousin, had established, giving even more weight and importance to Thomas's endeavors. So I thank you for that. Any more questions? Um, sorry. Uh, hi. Did you mention that they went uh, west towards uh, um, Calcutta, and then you mentioned Acapulco? That was yes. Aca which Acapulco? Was it Acapulco in Mexico? Yes. It's hard to believe, but Armenians oh. are very mobile. Yeah, they don't, I, they I don't, don't like staying put in one place. They don't like borders. They always excel. And this is what I find the most remarkable thing about Armenians, as an Armenian myself. They are experts at boundary crossing. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they were in Acapulco in the 1720s already. There is one merchant that I've studied who was hauled before the Inquisition Court in Mexico City in 1723, whose name was Don Pedro de Zarate, not a common Armenian name. Uh -huh. And he was brought and hauled before the Inquisition Court on the ac accusation against him, leveled by guess who? Another Armenian. In this case, an Armenian from Iran, who was the head of the Dominican mission in, I think, Veracruz or someplace like that, some place that on the tourist uh, circuit today. He was, this Armenian, was named Giraganyan, something Giraganyan, was the head of the Dominican mission there, and he had witnessed this poor Don Pedro Zarate uh, and wanted to snitch on him. Also, he snitched on him and accused him of being a, a schismatic heretic, and the poor Don Pedro was uh, brought before the uh, courts. Fortunately for us, that was, it happened, because now we know about Don Pedro's life and he had lived in Mexico City for 12 years and was planning to visit his relatives in London mm -hmm. from Mexico City. So but this is very interesting. So you have documents that yes. these Armenians, they went through India, Calcutta, and, and they yes. went to west to, to reach Exactly. And Acapulco. if I may make a movie allusion without completely um, Foundry or something, I can say, alluding to a famous movie by a famous movie in the James Bond series, The World Is Not Enough. For the Armenians, this was the case. Uh -huh. So they were, they were global through and through. There, by the way, do you know Nadia Wright? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know her personally, but I've read her book. Yeah, she, yes. she has done in extensive, Singapore. extensive yes. work in South yes. Asia. Yes. Thank you. Please. Any more questions?
Thank you. Mine is not a question, but it's footnotes. Okay. On the very last discussion, one of the research organization series of Armenian cities that was covered uh, all the way to Acapulco and so forth for future use. Uh, number two, uh, this Dohmi, uh, this Radaramchuna, which it used the model of Ishkans later on, a historian by the name of Pisantiere, and used that model in his book, he titled the book Armenian History, Armenian Ishkan Neruba, which is something like that. And then, uh, and then the third one, uh, regarding how the Armenian diaspora stretched and in port cities and so forth, uh, for you guys who are interested in economics, Armen Achemoglu's book, How Armenian, How Nations Fail, he covers that area fairly well the British extension, the Dutch extension, and so forth. And in your previous works, sometimes you have given the Armenian intersections with those ways. Thank yes. you very much. Please, thank you. Rafi, just a very quick question. Sure. When you reached Acapulco, yeah. would that have been from Manila? Yes. Because that's the only, that was where the gold train was going. Yes, yes. That was where the, that was the destination for what's known as the Manila Galleon, which is a convoy of Spanish ships that took uh, silver that the Spanish had discovered, quote unquote, in uh, Potosi, the largest silver mine in the history of the world, what is today Bolivia, as well as Zacatecas in Mexico. And they were shipping silver across the Pacific to Manila. And the minute the silver arrived in Manila, uh, most economic historians dealing with this have discussed, uh, the silver became sucked into China, the greatest economy in the world at the time, one quarter of the world's population and the economy. And it was known as the bomba aspirante effect. So the Armenians, of course, were attracted by the small silver. These merchants are incredibly, incredibly uh, border crossing and mobile, but also incredibly greedy. I mean, they are willing to live in Lhasa, Tibet, more than 12 years. And their most, their most important reason for going to Lhasa, Tibet was to trade gold for silver in China because silver was worth more and gold was worth less. And so again, this is why they were attracted to Manila and Don Pedro de Zarate, a person that I mentioned earlier, arrived in Manila and through with a Spanish friend, decided to board the Manila Galleon or something and traveled to Acapulco where he arrived and decided he liked the place. He stayed there for 12 years. And lo and behold, there was one other army in Mexico, and then one army and snitched on him. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <But laughs> so there are lessons to be learned from all this uh, in terms of positive lessons, but also certain cautionary lessons. Anybody Thank you very much for an enlightening afternoon. We do have a reception downstairs, so please join us downstairs. Thank you. Thank you.
Çeçenleri hayal çarptığı için atıyorlar. Çeçenleri hayal çarptığı için atıyorlar. 